Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Carlos Pedra, and I'm going to moderate a very interesting session, a fascinating topic on percutaneous sinus venosus ASD closure using covert stents. And we're going to have uh, a very dear uh, participant, uh, Sir Shaq Rashi. Uh, I've been working with Shaq in, in a bunch of uh, <laughs> uh, meetings, and uh, he's very dear to everybody, needs no introduction at all. Shaq, welcome to Brazil. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Pablo and Pedro. Uh, Carlos, rather, and Ariane. So thank you very much uh, for this invitation. It's good morning to all of you. Uh, an interesting topic. I hope you can see my slides uh, now. I'm sharing the screen. Um, so uh, interesting topic. Uh, we're going to address sinus venosus ASD closure. Uh, and I want to acknowledge at the outset uh, my colleague Eric Rosenthal uh, and then other colleagues, but Eric and I have developed this technique. Eric in particular has led the way uh, with this. Um, sinus venosus defect, well, uh, is the venal atrial connection of both the superior vena cava and pulmonary veins, which is in continuity with both atrial walls. The confluence lies outside the septum and the fossa ovalis uh, rims are intact. And really, essentially, it's the unroofing of the pulmonary vein, uh, uh, the tissue that separates the SVC from the right upper pulmonary vein. It's the unroofing that results in uh, partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage as well as the sinus venosus defect. So the defect is actually outside the atrial septum. These of, uh, traditionally have been considered as uh, purely being surgical domain and unsuitable for catheter closure. Uh, but although it's rare, surgery is still associated with the occasional complications such as uh, SVC uh, stenosis postoperatively or even occlusion of pulmonary veins and, uh, or pulmonary vein stenosis. Um, we've been doing uh, catheter repair of sinus venosus defect with covered stents. Um, and the factors that you have to take into account are the variations in the not, not only the location of the anomalous pulmonary veins uh, uh, into the SVC, but also in the size of these. Then there's another factor, which is the size of the right atrium, size of the left to right shunt, presence of bilateral SVCs, because that then influences the size of the right SVC where we would be planning uh, to put a stent, and the presence of patent foramen ovale. Now, this is really not new, so I want to give a give credit to uh, Abdul Wahab Abdullah in uh, Baghdad, who first reported uh, four cases to uh, CSI Frankfurt uh, in 2013, where he used um, uh, in these four patients uh, eight zig covered CP stents in two patients, uh, and covered CP combined with an Oclitec ASD device in one, and covered covered CP and Amplatz a PFO device in another. And so these were four patients who ranged in age between seven and 23 years. Also, uh, uh, Gaurav Garg um, reported a 35-year-old patient at that time uh, in whom he implanted an uh, Advanta V12 covered stent, uh, 12 millimeter diameter. And Jennifer Frank and Horst Sievert's team reported in 2015 a 65-year-old patient who had a, a Terry Sidres immediate release patch uh, implanted in across the sinus venosus defect. Apart from ourselves, where we started the procedure about six years ago now, Shiva Kumar in Chennai, India, also has a large experience. Now, um, this is diagrammatic. It's not necessarily entirely accurate and, and anatomical this, uh, depiction, but um, there's a sinus venosus defect with anomalous pulmonary veins, uh, the right upper ones, uh, and there is a flared stent uh, in place, and the intention is to have these anomalous pulmonary veins then draining directly into the left atrium. Uh, but as I mentioned, there are some pulmonary veins that drain higher up in the SVC, which then have the potential to either be uh, covered and blocked or uh, still draining into the SVC. 
Here are some uh, still pictures of, so we do require CT or MRI scans to confirm the anatomy and get a more detailed description of the uh, pulmonary veins, the right side of the pulmonary veins. There's the sinus spinosis defect in this example. And there are uh, right middle and right lower pulmonary veins going into the left atrium. And then the right upper pulmonary vein uh, with uh, in continuity with the SVC. Uh, and you can see on this slice that the right upper pulmonary vein has that potential uh, redirection ability uh, to the left atrium if we were to uh, put a stent in that position in the SVC. So we need to pick out who is this procedure suitable for. So we have to pick out the right uh, group of patients. So the anatomy needs to be suitable. Uh, we want to ultimately abolish the left to right shunt. We want to finish up with the right upper pulmonary vein draining into the left atrium. And so if we put a covered stent, uh, the right upper pulmonary vein should continue drainage un uh, in an unobstructed fashion into the left atrium. And then there should be no right upper pulmonary vein stenosis or occlusion. And obviously there should not be any uh, SVC stenosis. So uh, really CT scan is the hallmark, it is the essential investigation for assessing for suitability because we want to check whether we can put a stent either tubular or flared uh, and whether we can uh, then avoid any complications. Another aspect during uh, the uh, implantation of covered stents is uh, measuring left atrium and right, atrium, right upper pulmonary vein pressures simultaneously in order to see whether there's any gradient being uh, in, uh, in, introduced and whether the right upper pulmonary vein uh, needs to be protected or not. So what we want to do is have an, what's, what are the technical needs of a stent? Well, the, these are experimental uh, assessments of a, a 34 millimeter st uh, um, bib balloon uh, with a, a covered CP stent. Uh, what we want to do is make sure that the stent does not move in the SVC after implantation, so it should be anchored well, that it doesn't compress the right upper pulmonary vein, and that it's long enough to close the uh, sinus venosus defect. And then important to identify uh, significant right upper pulmonary veins draining somewhere else. Um, we did a little bit of bench testing originally, uh, and you can see here um, how the stent shortens as we increase the diameter from 18 millimeter diameter up to 30 millimeter diameter, how much shortening occurs. Uh, this started out as an eight centimeter length stent and you see uh, at 30 to, uh, millimeters by 34 millimeters, uh, it's um, uh, a bit shortened to less than six centimeters. And the other thing that we have to be wary of is um, as you flare, flare the bottom end, which is required in some of these sinus venosus defects, sometimes the covering lifts up as well, and that exposes a lower cell or two, which could potentially leave you with some residual shunting. So the suitable patients, therefore, are those that are fully grown or nearly fully grown, so we have gone down to teenage years as well with a significant left to right shunt and with, uh, keep emphasizing, the right upper pulmonary vein that can be redirected to the left atrium without compression. And so uh, when we're doing the assessment, we do balloon interrogation. Uh, the, uh, he, in this example, uh, balloons pass from the femoral vein on a guide wire circuit up to the internal jugular vein. This is an ASD sizing balloon. Uh, which is inflated, and you can see different bulges uh, in uh, areas with less resistance. In the initial cases, we went retrogradely from the arterial side up into from left ventricle into left atrium into the right at, uh, right upper pulmonary vein. And when the balloon was fully inflated, we did check angiograms. And in this particular example, you can see the right upper pulmonary vein angio showing unobstructed flow redirected into the left atrium, and therefore there's less concern about the bulging of the ASD sizing balloon and potentially the stent. Um, initially, also, we did 3D printing in all of the cases in order to be sure about the redirection uh, capabilities of the right upper pulmonary vein to the left atrium and uh, whether there was any potential for compression 
of uh, that pulmonary vein when uh, we were doing uh, balloon testing. We've recently started using, instead of 3D prints, the elusives from Realize Medical Elusives software. And you can see here VR assessment, virtual reality assessment as a useful tool, as an alternative to 3D printing. So we can uh, put a stent in there and then look at the anatomy in different views and different planes to see whether we can redirect the pulmonary vein. So here in a second, you'll see there the right upper pulmonary vein uh, draining to the left atrium without any compression uh, or uh, stenosis within it. And the SVC stent is in a good position, potentially able to abolish the left to right shunt within the atrial atrium as well. The challenges are that the SVC is distensible, it's non-stenotic, uh, it can be funnel shaped and the diameter varies from 10 millimeters to 30 millimeters even in grown up patients because that depends on the presence of uh, if there are bilateral SVCs, then the right SVC tends to be smaller. And then the bottom end SVC right atrial junction can be anywhere from 20 to 40 millimeters. So you can see that there is uh, the possible need for flaring at the bottom end. The anomalous right upper pulmonary veins, uh, they need to be redirected to the left atrium. That anatomy is not always clear. Uh, uh, so you have to really take some time to assess. And the higher up pulmonary veins uh, may be remote from the defect and we then take a surgical discussion view as to whether they would leave those uh, veins alone or whether they'll be able to redirect them. We still do the procedure under general anesthesia. TOE assessment is essential both to look at the pulmonary veins but also uh, the uh, sinus venosus defect. Access is right internal jugular, right femoral and uh, vein and right femoral artery access. We do a guide wire circuit from the femoral vein to the internal jugular. The uh, right upper pulmonary vein catheter nowadays is introduced by transeptal puncture, and that's uh, so all anti-grade, and therefore that's speeded things up. Um, ASD sizing balloon is the initial balloon that's interrogated the SVC. And if there is too much bulging and possibility of compression of the pulmonary vein, then we uh, pick a non-compliant balloon such as the ZMED or Altosa balloon uh, to ch uh, check for uh, suitability for closure as well as uh, avoidance of compression of the pulmonary veins. We do frequent pressure measurements and angiograms in SVC in the right upper pulmonary vein. Uh, the simultaneous pressures are essential. Obviously before, there shouldn't be any gradient during uh, there shouldn't be any gradient, and after stenting, where there shouldn't be any gradient, even though both the pressures may rise at the end of the procedure because of uh, uh, changes in the left atrial uh, uh, distance and filling. Uh, here are some of the steps. Uh, you see here a covered CP stent on a bib balloon. Uh, there's a custom-made stent from NewMed because they don't have CE mark. Uh, and uh, this is a lateral view showing uh, the stent being positioned <clears throat> and with the inner balloon inflated, uh, the AP view showing the position as well. And then uh, when the outer balloon's inflated, you can see a little bit of flaring at the bottom end uh, in both planes. But in this patient, there's only a small segment of the upper part of the CP stent that was in contact with the SVC. So we had some concerns about the possibility of migration of that uh, stent downwards. And so uh, we implanted an anchoring bare uh, CP stent uh, uh, of a 34 millimeter diam uh, length rather. Uh, and there now with anchored CP stent, uh, you see here the right upper pulmonary vein angio showing a good result. And there's a TOE showing unobstructed flow as well. The proper steps, however, here are shown here. There's the transeptal puncture, transeptal needle being performed. If the patient has a PFO, then obviously that speeds things up and we just use the PFO. Once we're across the atrial septum, the catheter is maneuvered into uh, the right upper pulmonary vein. And nowadays we use a cut pigtail uh, because not only do we need pressures, but we need frequent angiograms as well. Uh, and then once we're in place with a balloon as well, balloon interrogations carried out uh, together with right upper pulmonary vein angiograms, and that shows that the 
flow from the pulmonary vein is in fully into the left atrium, but there is some holdup in this case in the pulmonary vein. And so then we have to make decisions about how to protect uh, that pulmonary vein. Uh, here is some uh, pressure monitoring shown here. You see here there's absolutely no obstruction, both the pulmonary vein and uh, in red and the left atrial pressure in yellow uh, are increased with the balloon when it's fully inflated and after the stent. Whereas in this particular different example, uh, when we inflated the balloon, there was the uh, uh, gradient introduced uh, with a higher pressure in the right upper pulmonary vein and uh, slightly increased pressure in the left atrium. And so with pulmonary vein protection, we were able to show that uh, there was no gradient uh, in the, uh, 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 between the pulmonary vein and the left atrium. Another step that is required after the implantation of, uh, again, another TENZIG custom-made uh, covered CP stent around eight centimeter length, I think this one. Uh, and uh, once it's inflated, there's the inner balloon being inflated here. Uh, now the outer balloon's inflated and subsequently flaring of the lower end of the uh, stent is required like this in order to abolish any left or right shunt. Once again, in this sort of uh, situation, the TOE person has a, a very important role to play because what we don't want to do is flare the bottom end of the stent such that it gradually lifts up away from the septum and leaves a residual shunt. You can see the, what I'm trying to show, so, say, in this example. Here's a bicaval view with uh, uh, the sinus venosus defect. And here uh, the stent is now positioned, and you can see there is some contact between the bottom end of the stent and the top end of the atrial septum. Now, you can see that that's a very short point of contact, and so any more flaring could result in the stent <clears throat> being flared such that it uh, flips across the atrial septum and uh, leaves a residual shunt. So you have to make a careful decision about that. There's the uh, unobstructed flow from the right pulmonary vein to the left atrium. There's the uh, 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 dotted lines representing where the stent is. And there's 3D reconstruction showing, in, in this case, another patient with upper end of the septum shown by this arrow and the bottom end of the stent shown by this arrow. And that shows a good overlap, <clears throat> but that's where you have to assess where, how much flaring is required and how much leeway you have. Uh, one of the other practical uh, problems can be stent migration. And uh, uh, that, again, is to some extent determined by the anatomy. So you have to be prepared, uh, for example, in this case, <clears throat> we, we're using the sheath uh, to push up the stent back into position. Uh, and uh, once uh, there it goes upward. And once it's held in place, uh, we keep the sheath there. And then from the top end, in this example, we deployed uh, an eight zig uh, bare CP stent for anchoring purposes. And you can see here, once that is done, once the top end is anchored, then the bottom end can be flared more safely because otherwise uh, there is a potential for complete migration down into the right atrium. And now you can see much better flaring at the right atrial end with good flow uh, in the this SVC angiogram. And there's the pulmonary vein angiogram showing uh, right upper pulmonary vein draining into the left atrium uh, with pretty much unobstructed flow there. Um, I mentioned about <clears throat> protection of right upper pulmonary vein, and you see here in this example, there are two pulmonary veins, uh, and uh, with the balloon inflated, certainly the top one uh, uh, shows a holdup of contrast, and that means that you cannot you cover that up with a covered stent. Uh, the bottom <clears throat> pulmonary vein directs to the uh, left atrium appropriately, so that in that sort of example, uh, if the distance is such, we have a discussion with the surgeons. If they say that, <clears throat> sorry, they can re, uh, redirect that both these veins to the left atrium, then the patient is sent for surgery. If they say we would leave that alone, then <clears throat> we proceed with the uh, covered stent implantation plus a bare stent implantation at the top because we really want to try and maintain that uh, flow uh, right, uh, patency of that right upper pulmonary vein.
Um, protection is performed by, we use an Atlas balloon because um, what we want is the pulmonary vein to be not compressed in any way. So the Atlas balloon can cause an indentation in the covered CP stent, <clears throat> which is fine. And there's the uh, lateral view uh, of that. That can then result in, or oh, can't play that, uh, unobstructed pulmonary vein flow. So uh, here's another example of a uh, right upper pulmonary vein angio uh, showing uh, redirectability, but there was some compression possibilities of, of the uh, uh, right upper pulmonary vein. You can see a little bit of a kink in there. Uh, so we put an atlas balloon with a uh, altosa balloon in place, and you can see how uh, that protects. And then once the uh, CP stent is being implanted, we f uh, inflate the appropriate atlas balloon under high pressure so that there is no compression by the stent. And that usually uh, causes a little indentation in the stent, which is fine. And there's the final angiogram showing unobstructed flow from the right uh, upper pulmonary vein to the left atrium. So a brief word about um, our results up to March this year, uh, for the last six years, we've done 47 patients. These are within Evelina, uh, ranging in age from around 15 years to 78 years. And uh, <clears throat> all of the procedures have been successful. There were acute complications in two patients. One, which we never really got to the bottom of, uh, that was a, a post-procedure hemopericardium developed and uh, required drainage three days later. Uh, and at surgery, there was no bleeding source uh, found in relation to the stent. Uh, so it was thought that it was more likely related to the transeptal puncture, which had been difficult in the first place. Uh, but the, uh, after draining that, uh, the rest of the uh, uh, follow-up progress has been good. And then in one patient, the stent migrated about six hours after implant. Uh, we thought it was secure. It embolized to the right ventricle, so the patient, <coughs> patient was referred for surgery, removal of the stent, and surgical repair of the defect. And this was a seven centimeter long stent that was quite a large diameter, and therefore it shortened a lot. Uh, so in retrospect, we thought that either an eight centimeter stent should have been used or at the end of the fir that first one, we should have uh, overlapped it with an anchoring stent uh, at the top end. At the end of the procedure, there was a residual shunt in around 40% of the patients on angiography and in half the patients by color. By next day, there was 20% 20, 20 of patients had a residual shunt on uh, echocardiography. Uh, the two complications I've mentioned, there were other complications uh, uh, such as a femoral artery pseudoaneurysm requiring thrombin injection. Uh, this had been difficult uh, retrograde access. Uh, arm neuropraxia in one, which resolved. Atrial fibrillation requiring DC cardioversion in one. Um, stent migration, uh, I've shown that one already actually, uh, uh, need for uh, uh, anchoring bare stent. Um, Follow-up has been from one week to six years. We evaluate them by ECG, X-ray, and echo the day after the procedure. At three months, all patients have an ECG, echocardiogram, and CT scan. At one year, all patients have one MRI scan, and then they're seen one to two yearly. We also do 24-hour tapes at about one year, unless there are any problems before. At one year follow-up on MRI, QPQS has gone down from 2.6 down to 1.2 to 1. End diastolic volume of the right ventricle has gone down from 150 odd uh, mils per meter squared down to 95 mils per meter squared. So that's again an encouraging ratio of the right ventricle to the left ventricle from two and a half to before to 1.4 afterwards. There have been no sinus node dysfunctions in ECGs or 24 hour tapes. There were three patients with very small residual shunts. In one, this was um, re-evaluated from uh, in that it was uh, had been 2.8, and then about a year later, it was uh, 1.7. Uh, with a ratio reducing, but not enough. And so this patient underwent a repeat uh, stent implantation procedure. Uh, talking about additional stents, I've mentioned that a few times. The shorter the stents, the more likelihood there is of um, 
uh, needing additional anchoring stent. So if you use a five, well, five we don't use, but if you use a six centimeter long, there's about 75% chance of uh, needing an additional stent. These were our experience. Seven centimeter, the additional stent anchoring needed in 30% of patients, <clears throat> and in eight centimeter, only around 13%. So the longer the stent, and there are some people around the world who've used a 10 and 11 centimeter covered CP stents as well. Eric, my colleague Eric Rosenthal uh, collected data up to about a year ago from 12 centers as an international experience, 75 patients. You can see the age range a bit lower, 11 to 75 years, weight 50 to 130 kilograms. Bilateral SVCs were present in 17 patients. Half the patients had, uh, over half the patients had symptoms, uh, and there were a small percentage of patients that were asymptomatic. Procedural testing was done by compliant balloons in uh, 56 patients and non-compliant in 42. And pulmonary vein monitoring, essential step, retrograde arterial method in 20, uh, transeptally in 43, and obviously transesophageal echo in all. And this was an experience of uh, where 10 zig covered CP stents were used, and you can see the lengths varied from 5 to 11 centimeters and the diameters 18 to 34 millimeters. And at the end of the procedure, there was no leak in 34, trivial in 32, and mild in 4. And the complications were two stent embolizations before discharge, one of which was ours, one tamponade that was ours, and there is one patient who had pulmonary vein occlusion uh, at three months of a uh, three months after the procedure with pulmonary infarction, and uh, follow up uh, varied from two months to five years in those, and similar results to our MRI scans. Here are some pictures of uh, follow-up chest X-rays and CT scans showing patent SVC uh, and a, a patent or a nicely redirected right upper pulmonary vein. Uh, there's a better picture of the right upper pulmonary vein draining into the left atrium. And so I'll show Pablo's, <clears throat> I've taken the uh, uh, liberty of showing Pablo's pictures that he showed me of a, uh, I'm sure he'll talk more about this, where uh, it's important that we don't uh, miss out on virtual reality uh, assessment uh, uh, rather than 3D printing. Uh, this seems to be obviously much better. It's a very interesting reconstruction showing an excellent result in a patient. So what have we learned? We've learned that transeptal monitoring is uh, quicker than retrograde arterial access, and you can monitor pressures simultaneously in the left atrium and pulmonary vein. Uh, you can pass uh, an atlas balloon into the pulmonary vein if needed. Uh, we've learned about uh, assessing with both non-compliant and compliant balloons. Anchoring stents may be needed, and so you have to make a, a decision during the procedure. It's safer to do that. If there is a higher right upper pulmonary vein, you have to make a decision with the surgeons as to whether you leave it draining into the SVC or uh, put a bare stent. And then the longer stents give you better opposition and more stability and allows uh, flaring at the bottom end of the stent without too much uh, sh uh, foreshortening. So we've modified the procedure uh, since the start, we've gone to tra transeptal approach, we've gone to more frequent pulmonary vein protection with an atlas balloon in the right upper pulmonary vein. Uh, and uh, more recently, we've actually, uh, instead of waiting to decide about a anchoring stent, we put a six centimeter covered stent with a five centimeter bare stent on the same balloon. That tends to be eight centimeter long bib balloon. Uh, it's non-C marked, so you, we have to get uh, permission for that. And that then uh, makes it a single procedure, slightly more complex, but it's certainly a more secure way of anchoring the stent uh, when we're going to do the flaring afterwards. Thank you very much.